This is Physics 1110, Lecture 3, and today we're going to talk about coordinate systems and a review of trigonometry. So coordinate systems. We use coordinate systems to describe the position of a point in space. And a coordinate system consists of a fixed reference point, which we call the origin, usually labeled with an O, specified axes that have scales and labels, and instructions on how to label a point relative to that origin and the axes. So there's two types of coordinate systems we'll be using this semester, Cartesian or rectangular coordinate systems, and plane polar. So the Cartesian coordinate system is one that you're probably most familiar with. You have X and Y axes. And the points on this are labeled with an ordered pair XY. So if we look uh, over off to the side, we see point P. <clears throat> P is 5, 3. That would give its X and Y position. Positive X is usually selected to be to the right of the origin, and positive Y is selected to be up from the origin. Now if you look at point Q, minus 3, 4, that means we go to the left of the origin on the X axis, 3 units, and then up 4 units. Now in a plane polar coordinate system, instead of giving an x and y position, we're given a distance from the origin and an angle from the x-axis. So, positive angles are measured counterclockwise from whatever the reference line, usually the x-axis. And points are given a, a number pair again, this time it's r and theta. So. If we go now and review a little bit of trigonometry, we're going to find that the trigonometry we're reviewing is directly um, corresponds to the plane polar coordinate systems versus the rectangular coordinate systems. So if we remember from trigonometry, the sine of an angle um, where you have a right triangle, so the sine of an angle on a right triangle is equal to the length of the opposite side of the triangle from the angle we're interested in divided by the hypotenuse, which is the diagonal. The cosine of that angle is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse, and the tangent is the opposite side over the adjacent side. So that gives us a way of going back and forth between our different coordinate systems. We know that sine theta is y over r, cosine theta is x over r, and tangent theta is y over x. There's one more thing we need to remember is that's the Pythagorean Theorem. Pythagorean Theorem, remember, is r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So if we want to find an angle, we can first figure out r from the Pythagorean Theorem, and then we use an inverse trigonometric function. So for example, if sine theta is equal to some number, then theta is equal to the arc sine of that number. Or for example, theta is equal to the arc sine or the inverse sine of 0 0.707, that would be a 45 degree angle. Now be sure your calculator is set for the appropriate angular units for the problem. There are times where we will use degrees in this class, but other things, especially when we get to angular mo uh, motion, when things are rotating around, we'll want to use radians. So, Remember, there's 360 degrees in a circle, and there's 2 pi radians in a circle. So if I were to take the arctangent of, say, 0.5774, and my calculator was set for degrees, I'd get 30 degrees. But if I had my calculator set for radians and took the arctangent of 0.5774, I'd get 0.5236 radians. Now, 0.5263 5, 2, 3, 6 radians and 30 degrees are the same angle. They're just different units. Just like we talked about last time, different units for different situations. Similar to, you know, measuring in feet or measuring in meters. Sometimes we'll measure in degrees and sometimes we'll measure in radians. And here we also have the conversion factor. 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. So I can go from rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates and back and forth. So given an x and y, I would use the Pythagorean theorem to find r, and then use x and y in the inverse tangent function to find the angle, or 
I could use r and, uh, and x and cosine, or r and y and sine, doesn't matter. Whereas if I want to go from polar to rectangular, I know that x is equal to r cosine theta, and y is equal to r sine theta. So let's look at some examples. Let's convert the following rectangular coordinates to plane polar coordinates. We'll start with 3, 4. So first thing we want to do is find r. So using the Pythagorean theorem, r is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared. That's equal to 5. And then to figure out theta, I can say, well, theta is the arc sine of y over r. So that'd be the arc sine of 4 fifths, which is 53 degrees. How about the next one? I know that um, 5, 12, 13 is a special triangle, if you remember from trigon trigonometry. If not, we can use our Pythagorean theorem. r is the square root of 5 squared plus 12 squared, which gives us 13. And then theta is the arc sine of 12 thirteenths, which is 67 degrees. How about this last one? Minus 3, 7. Well, r is simple. It's the same we use the Pythagorean theorem, 3 squared minus 3 squared plus 7 squared is equal to 7.6. But we can't just blindly plug into our trigonometric functions anymore because we're no longer in the first quadrant of our coordinate system. So let's look at this one a little bit deeper. So I can draw my uh, a triangle here where I go minus 3 over on the x-axis and up 7 on the y-axis. And now I can find the angle phi in that triangle. Phi is just the arc sine of y over r, which is the arc sine of um, 7 over 7.6, a little typo there, which is 70, 67 degrees. But that gives us that angle shown on the red triangle. It doesn't give us theta. Theta, remember, is the angle measured from the x-axis. So to get theta, we know in a line there's 180 degrees, so 180 minus 67 is 113 degrees. So the plane polar coordinates would be 7.6 comma 113 degrees. Well, what about the other way? Let's convert from plane polar to Cartesian coordinates. So x is equal to r cosine theta, so that's 10 cosine of 100 degrees, which gives you minus 1.7. y is r sine theta, 10 sine 100 degrees, which is 9.8. So that's a lot easier to go from plane polar to Cartesian because <clears throat> the trigonometric functions automatically pull out which is positive and which is negative. I don't have to worry about what quadrant I'm in. So for 530, x is 5 times the cosine of 30, which would be 4.3. y is 5 sine 30, which is 2.5. So the ordered pair is 4.3, 2.5. The last one, the same method, the x coordinate is 25 cosine 300, which is 12.5 y is r sine theta, which is 25 times sine of 300, which is minus 21.7. All right, let's look at one more example. Here we have a triangle, and I have some unknown values. I don't know what r is. I don't know what phi is. I don't know what x is. But I'm given that it's a right triangle. I know that one angle is 30 degrees, and one side is 10. So let's we'll start out by trying to determine x. And we can use the tangent function. We know that x is equal to r tangent 30, so that gives me 17.3. Now that I know what x is, I can use that in the Pythagorean theorem. r is equal to the square root of 10 squared plus 17.3 squared, which gives me 20. And finally, I know that the sum of the angles in a triangle are 180 degrees. The right triangle is 90, so that means that phi plus 30 has to be equal to the other 90, or phi is equal to 60 degrees. The last thing I want to talk about in today's lecture is problem solving. So let's go through the strategy that uh, the book gives, and then we're going to look at each one individually. 
In order to solve problems in physics, first thing we want to do is read the problem. Then we're going to draw a diagram. We're going to label all of our physical quantities, identify the principles and list all of our data, choose some equations, and solve those equations. We're going to solve them algebraically, substitute our known values, and then check the answer. So let's look at this in depth, reading the problem. I suggest you read it at least twice. Make sure you really understand what's going on. Identify the nature of the problem. And then we're going to draw a diagram. Some types of problems require very specific types of diagrams. So, For example, we'll be working on forces. We'll want to draw a free body diagram. Or when you're working on optics, you'll want to draw a ray diagram. Once we have that, drawn, we want to label all the physical quantities. We can label that right on the diagram. And we're going to use letters that remind us of the quantity. So for example, um, for velocity we would label it V. For mass we would label it M. A lot of the quantities that we're going to talk about have specific letters that we'll always use for them. And of course once we have a uh, figure, we want to draw a coordinate system and label it so that we know uh, very quickly when we're looking at it, how it relates to the, our coordinate system. So the next thing we want to do is identify principles and list all the data. So whatever the principle is involved. Maybe it's a free fall problem. If it's a free fall problem, then we'll want to um, you know, just make note of that so we know which equations to use. We want to list the known and unknown information. So anything that's known, we can also label that uh, on the diagram or just list. Oh, I know what the x position is. I know what the y position is. And write out specifically what are the things that we're looking for. On our diagram, maybe you want to circle your unknown. Maybe you just want to write them out in your list with a big question mark next to it. So you know from reading the problem exactly what you're trying to determine. Now we want to choose equations. We know what principles we're going to be using because you already identified that. We're going to choose equations or sets of equations that apply to that specific problem. Once we have those equations, we look for the unknown and we solve it algebraically for the unknown quantity. Now this is really important because a lot of people will plug numbers in right away and then just work with the numbers. The problem is um, in physics there's a lot of negative values that are often floating around and they get lost when I plug in numbers too quickly. If we just use algebra to solve for the unknown first and then substitute in, we'll have better luck at getting the correct answer. So once I've got the equation solved, substitute the data into the equation, obtain a result, and be sure and include the units. Check your answer. Do the units match? If you're supposed to be finding a length and the units, and you've kept track of them all, come out to be meters per second, you know we have a problem. Does the answer seem reasonable? If we're determining the acceleration of a car and how fast it's going after 30 seconds, you know, if it's going 18,000 miles an hour, probably you've done something wrong. We can do maybe an order of magnitude calculation to see if it's reasonable. Are the signs appropriate and meaningful? Is it, do we have it accelerating forward but have a negative velocity? Then we've made a mistake somewhere. We always want to check our problem, check our solution. Equations are the tools of physics. Understand what the equations mean and how to use them. Some equations that we will give and we solve for uh, will be for very specific situations and they're not to be used in just any situation. And if you all you do is memorize, um, all right, I, I have these, oh, here's an equation, let me throw it in, without understanding what that equation is really for, oftentimes you can get nonsense answers. Make sure you understand what all the variables in an equation mean before you use it. Carry through the algebra as far as possible. Only substitute numbers at the end. And be organized. Part of solving problems in physics is solving them in a logical order. And 
If things are nice and organized, it's easy to go through in a logical order. If things are scattered everywhere and you really don't know what's going on, it's going to be very difficult to get the correct solution. So, today was a short lecture. What did we talk about? Coordinate systems. Rectangular coordinate systems, plane polar coordinate systems. You should know how to label a point and draw each of those coordinate systems. And you should be able to take a point from one coordinate system and figure out what it is in another coordinate system. And to do that, we need to use trigonometry. Remember the laws of what a cosine, what a sine, what a tangent is, Pythagorean theorem. Um, you will need these, especially when we get to vectors and we start um, solving problems with vectors, we'll be using a lot of trigonometry. Make sure that you remember how to do your trig. And we talked about problem solving. A logical step-by-step -step process of going through a problem that if we follow this process every time, we'll be sure to be able to get the correct answer at the end.